The closest Mark and Brenda Galbraith had ever gotten to a hurricane aftermath was in front of their TV set. That was before yesterday. Less than an hour after they arrived in Houston, the two Oklahoma City Red Cross volunteers were sent out on the streets of a city they didn't know to help the residents of a neighborhood more than 500 miles from their own home. The 25-mile drive to the Houston suburb of Channel View had its own pitfalls. Closed streets, debris in the roadway, and some roads that were nearly flooded out. Have they officially closed this shelter on us? Channel View High School had been set up as the major shelter for a community that had been robbed of its power, phones, and water supply by the hurricane. Some and to their surprise, they arrived to find out they weren't just a part of the Red Cross team here. They were the whole team. And suddenly, Channel View's problems became theirs, too. Oh, we'll come well, back. We if it will. kicks up again, we'll be back. That's There's no doubt about that. That's the thing that helped us out a lot with this place. It must have been horribly frightening at the time. I've been talking to some of the people at the shelter, and uh, the sound was just really took their breath away. The human tragedy is something that we try and separate ourselves from. We, we do feel their tragedy, but if we let everyone's hurt get to us, then we wouldn't be able to do our job of helping them. The Galbraiths know they may be here in the Houston area for a week or more, but their most immediate concerns are providing food and water to an area that has little of either. And on this night, this school will be home to about 80 people. We'll come back if you get hungry. AK-5N, Roger, tell them to send a, a vac of coffee. 80 plus two new friends who drove 500 miles to help them. Roger, I'll stand by. Roger, tell him to sit. Roger, tell him to sit. Roger, tell him to sit. like a square peg in a round hole your first day of school. For these first grade students in Mrs. Thompson's class at Dennis Elementary, nerves and knotted stomachs were the order of the day. Putnam City School District is a big one with 17,000 students. It is also one of the richer districts and air conditioned classrooms are a nice convenience that make the first day of school a bit easier. We asked some of the fourth grade students how they felt about their return. School gives me something to do. Well, I'm thinking, am I going to have a fun time and all that? And who do I have in my class? And, and am I going to do real good? And... I like summer more than winter. So from now till May, it's back to work. Oklahoma City School District can look forward to its big day right after Labor Day. 
Bellashaw Action 4 at Dennis Elementary School. The government loses because it gets to rebuild the road, the, the roads. Rebuild has on every major. And I don't know if the president's doing any rethinking, but my guess is that it's not going to change what we're doing over there. You know, what we're doing essentially is just kind of uh, trying to stay in the middle and keep people from uh, uh, blowing the country up before we can work out agreements for uh, troop withdrawals on all sides. It's disappointing to see something that you've worked so hard to build up crash and burn the way that this, this prison has and symbolically the Department of Corrections has when you know that it was preventable. It's been a long night and day for many of these people outside an Oklahoma City mortgage company. Some arrived here yesterday afternoon. They are trying to get their share of $105 million in low-interest mortgage money. Dozens of lending institutions are offering graduated equity loans at a fixed rate of 10.4%. And there is a 17-year mortgage for the borrowers. In order to avoid being left out, lots of these people camped out. I've been here since uh, about 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon, and she showed up about seven o'clock and brought all our blankets and chairs and some food and all that. The night was pretty peaceful. I slept all night on the concrete, of course, but it was pretty comfortable. Well, I brought my uh, cooler and a uh, cot and sleeping bag and enough food to carry me through. <laughs> Once inside, officials explained how to qualify for the loans and filled out paperwork. Statewide, the bond money should finance home purchases for 2,000 families. Because demand for the low interest money is so great, there are bound to be disappointed latecomers. Unfortunately, uh, most of the people out here will not, we will not have money available by the time we get to them. That's the unfortunate problem with it. Expecting a large turnout, many companies did what they could to make the crowd more comfortable. Refreshments helped in bearing the long wait, but for those who received loan approval, the wait was soon forgotten. Ed Stewart, Action 4. These animals don't know it, but there's a blood drive on at the Oklahoma City Zoo. A blood drive because there's a new blood bank, or at least the beginnings of one. These gazelles gave blood just this morning, and little do they realize they've become part of an innovative, one-of-a-kind program. Many zoos pull blood routinely to look for disease, antibodies to disease, and to do routine diagnostic checks. But this is the first time that I'm aware that a, a systematic collection of large amounts of blood has been made. After the blood is collected, it comes here to the Oklahoma Blood Institute. Red cells are separated from the plasma, and for the first time, researchers are able to study animal blood as it's never been studied before to prevent disease and, in the Oklahoma spirit, share the knowledge. Eventually, we might even extend it to other zoos or make the serum and blood that we have here available to other zoos if they need it for diagnostic purposes. The blood bank program is still in the developmental stages, and one of the big problems now is getting blood from sometimes vicious animals. Zoo animals, unlike their wild kingdom counterparts, are confined to cages, but that doesn't make things easier. 
it's not like Marlon Perkins makes it look like all the time. It's, uh, I think, uh, it's a challenge. <laughs> At the Oklahoma City Zoo, Dan Slocum, Action 4. Four days from now, these quiet hallways will be filled with the sound of students. So teachers worked extra hard today getting their classrooms ready for the invasion. Many welcomed the work to take their minds off this year's teaching contract. It's not earth shattering and we're not going to be millionaires, but I'm thankful that we got a raise. A little bit of an increase, so I'm not going to be greedy. I never thought we would get more, ever. And I see that the outlining schools didn't receive what we did. And uh, I don't want to consider myself lucky because I would like to have received more. Uh, but I think uh, our negotiators did pretty well, considering the circumstances. Cindy Neighbors knows the contract frustrations firsthand. She was on the union and, negotiating team. And I think that we can really be proud because the main thing that we needed in this year's contract was something to do with job security because the tighter money gets, the more likelihood that people will be laid off. And that was the main accomplishment we made this year was to be able to get a provision in there that, that determines the order in which people will be laid off and then the order in which they'll be recalled also. Nalita Johnson appreciates the efforts of the negotiators, but doesn't like the contract at all. I'm going to be getting around a $450 raise, and over a period of a year, that's not very much. It will, won't keep up with the cost of living, and we won't be having any frills or extra thrills at home on $450 a year. So we all want more money. You know, I want to keep up with the cost of living like everybody else. Nolita only wishes her raise was based on the number of students she teaches. Forty kindergartners will jam into this classroom when school starts next Tuesday. Mark O'Neill, Action 4, Eugene Field School. The first black to fly in space, Dr. Guy Bluford, was pushing the buttons, releasing the Indian satellite. With the satellite out of the bay, the crew turned the shuttle and pointed its antenna toward the tracking data and relay satellite. Tedris has been supplying about 30% of the voice communication between the Challenger and the ground. It will take an all-important role on the next shuttle mission. Just before the crew settled down for dinner, President Ronald Reagan called. But on behalf of all our people, I want to thank you all for your courage, your commitment to space research. You've set a fine example for all our young people. God bless all of you. Thank you, Mr. President. Susan Starnes for NBC News, Houston. The astronauts were working their cameras in the payload bay when the Challenger sailed into a sunrise this morning. One of 17 sunrises it sees every 24 hours. As the sunlight brightened the cargo hold, it enhanced the pictures of action 
with the big 50-foot-long manipulating arm that's used to move heavy loads aboard shuttles. The load this time is called a payload flight test article, abbreviated PUFTA, a dumbbell-shaped heavyweight, a four-ton item used to simulate what NASA hopes to retrieve next April, a $90 million satellite that broke down. The agency hopes to repair it in orbit. The search for debris or any sign of the Korean airline jumbo jet has been hampered because the Soviet Union has ignored all requests to look in its territorial waters. The Japanese Maritime Safety Agency did find an oil slick on the water some 40 miles from the Soviet island of Sakhalin. The oil specimens are to be tested in the next few hours to determine if they contain jet fuel. There will also be a continuing search by Japanese planes and American AWACS flown from the U.S. Air Base on Okinawa. day of school can be a fun time or a frightening time. And Mrs. Sperling's first grade class at Gatewood Elementary was typical of first grade classes across the city. We will learn a lot. The first day is usually the day teachers learn names, assign seats, and learn the personalities of those enrolled in their class. Vicki Sperling says students are always a bit apprehensive about the first day of school, and they usually come to class with some preconceived notions about what it is they will be learning. The first thing they usually expect is to learn to read the first day. They expect it to fall upon their heads when they walk through the door the first morning. Uh, I guess because everybody has built them up to say, oh, you're going to learn to read in first grade. And so they naturally expect it to just hit them. How did these first graders feel sitting in a class for the first time? I've done good so far. So good. Isn't this pretty? <laughs> I want to learn more stuff to be smarter. We get to go up for recess. It eat led to the cafeteria. This is only my second time. Okay, go play. The playground is the only reminder these children will have about summer, as if three months of recess wasn't enough. From now till May 31st, play will only be a part of their daily routine of learning. Bella Shaw, Action 4 at Gatewood Elementary School. According to employment officials, most job opportunities this decade will be low-tech positions. Computer firms and other companies involved in high technology will continue to receive attention from college graduates. But statistics indicate the percentage of those opportunities will be limited. University placement advisors are quick to point out graduates should not set their sights too high when looking for their first job. We deal with a lot of people that uh, they think they can start at mid-level or upper-level management, and you just can't do it. You have to start at the bottom and work your way up. If the enrollments continue in the, in the highly technical areas, I think we're going to see more graduates on the market than there are jobs available. The federal government predicts the ranks of secretaries, nurses' aides, and truck drivers will grow during the 80s. While those areas attract workers, jobs for programmers, systems analysts, operators, data entry workers, and other computer specialists will make up only 5% of the employment growth during this decade.
The argument boils down to a difference between state statutes and the state's constitution. Governor Nye quotes a statute that says the governor shall appoint replacements for vacancies in state government. But legislators say the constitution is clear. The House runs House affairs, and a vacancy in the House is created only by death, resignation, or removal by two-thirds vote. None of those things have happened here. A suspension is not covered. Finally, House members are elected, not appointed. House members are trying to protect their powers here. They, they say they don't want a confrontation with Nye, me. but they will refuse to grant House privileges to any Nye appointment. It would be an embarrassment not only to the people that have been chosen for these two positions, uh, it would be an embarrassment to some legislators that would have to vote against them because there is not a vacancy in this office. And the governor, the governor should not, should not even attempt it. An attorney general's opinion has been requested. It will probably come out next week. The governor's office says, though, that regardless of what that opinion is, they will go ahead and make those appointments. Members of the House say they will surely refuse to seat the two new members. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, at the State Capitol. The, the hard part was coming in and acquiring 26 separate pieces of real estate with no financial backing or partners, uh, taking a, a area that was previously run down and, and rough and turning it around and, like I say, now the easy part, the tenants are coming in, the leasing is going full blast. We've got approximately 80,000 square feet of this project pre-leased right now. Governor Nye spent most of the morning meeting with legislative leaders at the mansion. Nye not only calls the special session, but he establishes the agenda as well. Legislators were trying to have some input. One of the first orders of business will be an emergency set aside of the state's competitive bidding laws to get Connors open as quickly as possible. Legislators will also have to decide where the funds for the reconstruction will come from. There is emergency money available in a special bond sinking fund and in general revenues. At an afternoon press conference, Nye admitted he would have the lawmakers consider other items, but he was not willing to discuss them. He did reiterate, though, a few items that will not be considered. I can tell you some of the things the call will not include, and I repeat, it will not include a tax increase or consideration thereof. It will not include cap legislation for corrections. It will not include early commutation uh, in the correction system. Nye says his staff will send a partial agenda to legislators in the next couple of days, but he says that he will change that agenda, and those amendments could come during the session itself. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, at the State Capitol. You know, it's hard to believe that a little rock like this can cause you a lot of grief. Now, I've never had one, but I've seen a lot of patients with them. What I'm talking about is a kidney stone. But now, thanks to improved techniques, getting rid of a kidney stone isn't quite the hassle that it used to be. Now with uh, the instrument, the ultrasonic uh, lithotripsy equipment, we're able to put a small tube through the back and into the kidney itself. And then using special telescopes, we can look in through this tube or sheath, view the stone, then put the ultrasonic probe against the stone, vibrate the stone and dissolve it into powder. And after the stone is pulverized, this powder is simply sucked right out of the kidney. Now this procedure is a lot easier on you than a surgical operation. And there's a lot of other advantages as well. 
Well, the patients love it. You know, they they have such a so much less pain than other surgical patients. They're up and walking the next morning with minimal discomfort. They leave the hospital, as I say, sometimes within the first two to three days, and they leave with a Band-Aid on their back rather than having to come back to the office with uh, sutures that need to be removed. Terry Rodriguez recently had a kidney stone removed by this technique, and she was really surprised and happy to see how small the scar really was. Um, I went in on a Sunday, and Monday they inserted the tubes, and they inserted them until Wednesday. Wednesday, I was taken back down again, and the rock was exploded and sucked out. I was up through the whole thing, and um, it worked. You know, this new technique seems to be a major advance in the management of kidney stones. If you've got one, I really think you ought to investigate the procedure. If it applies to you, you can get back to work quicker, and you won't feel as bad. Take good care of yourself. I'm Dr. Red Duke. Bladder infections are very common in all of the population. Would you believe that 20% of all women will have a bladder infection at some time during their lifetime? What usually happens is they begin to urinate frequently. They have, more importantly, burning on urination, feel as though they cannot empty their bladder, can actually go on and have bleeding with clots and getting up at night to pass this painful urine. Now, there are three groups of women that you really need to watch for bladder infections. These are pre-pubertal girls from toilet training through the time that they go through puberty. Then there are the young women in their late teens and early 20s. And finally, the postmenopausal women. Now, a lot of urologists believe that the reason little girls have bladder infections is that they hold their urine too long and don't empty the bladder often enough. And according to Dr. Corriere, the reason young women have problems with bladder infections is some type of vaginal infection, either from the use of tampons or the result of sexual intercourse. There's no question that sexual intercourse is related to bladder infections. And finally, there's the older age group, the postmenopausal woman, who probably has an estrogen deficit, and by giving her replacement estrogen, you can stop her recurrent bladder infections. Now, in general, these kinds of bladder infections are easily cleared up by simply drinking a lot of liquid. Now, another idea people have about bladder infections is that they're caused by drinking a lot of soft drinks. Well, there's nothing infectious about drinking soft drinks. But don't get the idea that I'm selling soft drinks either. Now, I fully realize it's no fun to be sick. And the fact that one out of every three women who have a bladder infection will have a recurrence in 18 months is not particularly good news. The good news is you can control it. If it happens to you, just see your doctor. Just take good care of yourself and persist. I'm Dr. Red Duke. Now today we're going to talk about a very common problem, and that's getting older. If it's happening to you, you'll notice that some things start slowing down. When you get to be around 55, if you're a man, you're liable to have trouble passing your urine. They'll find that if they go to bed after the late news, they can't make it till 6 o'clock in the morning. As time goes on, they begin to find they've got to urinate more and more frequently during the daytime. And when they go in to urinate, they have difficulty getting their stream started. Now, there are a lot of myths surrounding this type of problem. One of them is the fact that as you get older, the bladder gets weaker. That isn't true at all. There's at least one very good reason that you may be having trouble urinating. 
your prostate may have enlarged. The prostate gland is located at the base of the bladder and the outflow of the bladder runs through the prostate. When the bladder contracts, the area that the prostate gland is around must relax to allow the urine to pass freely through it. And as that gland enlarges, it compresses and squeezes the neck, making it more and more difficult to pass urine. And the other myth that's associated with prostate disease is the fact that people fear if they have this problem corrected, there may be serious sexual dysfunction. Well, with current techniques, that's usually not the case. Now, if you're having any kind of noticeable change in urinary habits, you need to see a doctor. About 10% of all men over the age of 55 will have to have this operation to correct the problem. But the good news is, it works. Now, for God's sakes, if you're having trouble like this, don't put off seeing your doctor. You could save yourself a lot of problems and prevent a lot of damage to your bladder and your kidneys. And let me tell you, that's a lot worse. Getting old isn't such a bad deal, and it's not near as much trouble today. Just look out for yourself. I'm Dr. Red Duke.